And here we go. We have lift off. Propulsion continues to be normal. Our CPA chamber pressure looks good. Following up. All right, folks, you know the drill. As usual, we're going to start off with some logistics. Can you hear me? Let's see some five by fives in chat. Oh, I got a bunch of them. All right. Very nice. Let us know also where you're tuning in from, everyone. Hey, hey, so great to see you all. Oh, I love the five by fives. Excellent. Good, good, good. All right, good. Well, everyone, my name is Alicia Siegel. We are about to dive into yet another NSF Live slash Intrepid Museum Astro Live show. And as you can see, our production team's a little small today. We do love to, of course, ask our viewers to help us out here. So thank you all for that, for the sound check. And uh, remember, also, if you guys have any questions uh, throughout the show today for our guests, please do pop them in the chat. We'll be uh, uh, definitely trying to filter through some of those as well as the show goes on. You might notice also we are missing another familiar face on screen today. Yes, as you have probably noticed, Doss has been working super, super hard this week, bringing you a bunch of other fun content, but he is feeling a little under the weather right now. So he is still here, but just behind the scenes, behind the curtain, as it were, uh, helping us out, as is Kevin. So definitely throw them some love in the chat too. Now, we have another really great topic for you today. Today is all about CubeSats, those little toasters that are being shot up into space to do cool science, as we say. So there are so many really, really neat projects being conducted by CubeSats up there in space literally every day, and also so many more being dreamed up and developed down here on Earth all around us today and every day. Um, and it's not just NASA scientists working on them either. Some of them are even students who get to do some really amazing projects and become you know, the next pioneers of things that might send us to faraway places someday too. Um, so we're going to be talking about some of those projects today, highlighting a couple of them. One of them is called Lisa T that is being worked on at NASA Marshall right now uh, by our guest, Dr. John Carr, and also Alpha CubeSat, uh, which is going to be um, talked about by some Cornell students who are working on that too. And also a quick plug for the museum. We have a great exhibit going on in our space shuttle pavilion all about the project right now. Uh, some really cool technology and applications behind it, as well as a really neat intersection with art and holograms too. So you're going to hear more about both of those projects in just a bit. Uh, if you were on site for our April Astronomy Night, you may have had a chance to actually explore that exhibit and uh, see it a little bit more, see what that CubeSat looks like a little bit up close with the replica there, and also meet C. Bangs, who uh, was the artist involved in creating some of those holograms for it too. So definitely come by the museum and check it out. Had to get that out of the way, of course. So you all are going to meet a few of those dreamers and doers in just a minute. Uh, of course, though, we do want to give a special shout out to the New York Space Grant Consortium, who does help to support our show through a NASA cooperative agreement. Thank you to them. And also, of course, thank you to all of you tuning in today. Again, uh, toss us a like and a subscribe whenever or wherever you're tuning in from. And again, let us know uh, where that is, too. So. Let's go ahead and get started. I would like to welcome my guests on screen here. So let's get them up. Excellent. First up, we've got Dr. John Carr, who is the Deputy Chief Technologist for, at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, he's also the Principal Investigator for the LISA T Project, which stands for the Lightweight Integrated Solar Array and Antenna. So I'll let him get more into that in just a bit. 
Uh, we've also got Joshua Umansky Castro, Castro, who is the mission manager for the Alpha CubeSat project and a PhD candidate in aerospace engineering at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. And also Gillis Lowry, who is the publicity lead for Alpha CubeSat and also an astronomy student at Cornell University and also a planetarian, uh, planetarium facilitator at the St. Louis Science Center. So shout out to all the planetarians watching today. I am myself one as well. And she uh, is also conducting some exoplanet research which is also super cool. So thank you all for joining us to talk about CubeSats and some of the really neat projects that you're working on, uh, you know, via some of this tiny technology. Um, to start off, though, uh, I think it'd be great to just get a broad overview of, um, first of all, the projects you're working on now, but really starting off with basics. For those of you who are tuning in who may not even know what the heck a CubeSat even is, what is this? Dr. Carr, I'd like to hand it over to you to kick us off here. You've been working with this type of technology for quite a while now. Um, again, you are based at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Can you explain to our viewers what is a CubeSat and what, generally speaking, is their purpose? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll do my best here. Well, Kevin, maybe you could pull up a uh, picture zero zero and that might give a nice visual while we talk it. So, um, you know, CubeSats are very small spacecraft, modular in size, typically built of U's or units. So this here is a picture of a 1U, which is about 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters cubed. Now you can imagine we can take multiple of these units, these U's, and create a 2U, a 3U, a 6U. Uh, a 12 u and even some people up in the 24 and, and 27 u So, you know, these small spacecraft um, really have been advantageous since their invent uh, out west over at Cal Poly. And, uh, you know, in their early stages, they were really utilized as training tools, as educational tools for students to be able to put together um, from start to finish, you know, a real spacecraft and then go and fly these spacecraft and, and do something simple, you know, phone home or take a picture, uh, take a video and send it back. Um, but suddenly, right, with uh, 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 shrinking of electronics, right, with, with advancements in deployables, um, uh, with the innovators that we have throughout the community, um, there was this huge, huge realization that these small spacecraft can be highly advantageous, not just for students, but for science, for exploration, for NASA, for DOD, for the entire community, okay? And, and you can imagine one of their main advantages is their lightweight, right? When you ship something across the country, the lighter uh, uh, it is, or, or maybe a better way to say is the heavier it is, the more expensive it is to, sh to ship. Same thing for space, right? So now we're starting to talk these small, lightweight, uh, easier to launch, easier to get into space. Um, and, and the community is finding really useful things to do for them. So you've got companies out there um, uh, like Planet, right, Who, who's doing Earth observation, you know, disaster relief, right? You've got um, companies out there like Starlink, right, uh, um, uh, doing comm work and internet. We use these at NASA uh, to go in and do technology demonstrations, right? Small, quick platforms that we can put new technologies on and go and demonstrate them. The DOD uses them for defense, right? Battlefield rapid launch to get uh, the calm video, et cetera. And, and I'm sure we could sit around and, and, and go around the circle, you know, for 30 minutes coming up with all the different applications. Uh, but it's really an exciting time, and, and CubeSats, these small spacecraft, are really reducing the barrier to space and really giving a lot of people who previously wouldn't have had opportunity to work on a spacecraft, put something useful in the space to, to do just that. All in there. And that's actually really interesting. You were saying that originally they started off as an educational tool then? Yeah, yeah, that, is, that was their function um, at their invention for aerospace students to be able to, from start to finish, um, design, fabricate, and eventually launch their own spacecraft, you know, within uh, a one year or two year type class. Which is actually exactly what is going on with Alpha CubeSat, right? So uh, Joshua and Gillis, um, you all are students at Cornell University in Ithaca, and you are part of this program now where you have created 
or you know are in the process of creating and about to launch hopefully soon um this cubesat yourself so can you tell us just a bit about the program itself that has allowed you this opportunity to do that sure so um specifically cornell university um we have had it's a bit longer time frame than a one to two year class um for us at least uh our CubeSat started in 2016, um, and that was with a high school student, Isabel Dawson, and her concept for Cayuga Sat. Um, and from that, we've just been working many years, slowly improving um, all of our tech uh, until we've gotten it pretty much almost to, to launch. Amazing, amazing. So this is something that is, is it like a class or is this like a side project that you guys are doing in your free time? Or uh, I know Joshua, like you're working on your PhD right now. So is this your project or how does that work with students? Uh, sure, Gilles, you want to take this one too? Sure, yeah. So, I mean, for Josh, a bit different. Uh, for me and the other students working on it, uh, we do get academic credit if we want to. Um, so in that way, in a sense, it is sort of a class. You write a report at the end. Um, but a lot of it is just, you know, you go in at the times that you're able to go in, um, put in a certain number of hours working on it um, each week. Uh, so in a certain sense, it is similar to a class, but um, for some of us, it's become a bit, a bit more than that. Um, obviously for Josh as a PhD student, and for me, um, I'm the publicity lead, um, and I'm not an aerospace student. Uh, so I don't have all of the same uh, technical know-how, perhaps, that all the other students on the team do, but even so, I've been able to contribute as well, um, and I've been able to help build this great spacecraft as well. Um, so it's a bit more than a class. I've been able to build the spacecraft a bit, uh, learn all this history about it, about CubeSats, um, and try to communicate this to the public now in situations like this. That's spectacular. And yeah, so there are a number of different places and a number of different universities where you, if you're a student out there watching this, you can get involved in this type of technology as well um, and create some of these really interesting prototypes um, and really, you know, push the boundaries of what they're doing up there. Um, but let's let's go back to what we're actually working on now. What are the actual applications that we're using these CubeSats for? So, um, Dr. Carr, you are working on something called Lisa T, the lightweight integrated solar array and transceiver and antenna. Sorry, uh, well, that's antenna transceiver, right? That's the T. Um, yeah. Mouthful. NASA and, and their acronyms, right? So, can you uh, can you give us an overview of the Lisa T project then? So, again, you're you're based at uh, NASA Marshall, and this is dealing with something called photovoltaics, right? Yes, that's right. So we are working on solar panels, solar rays for small spacecraft. And, and just to take a step back on what photovoltaics are, um, in, in essence, you know, you try to take the photons, the energy from the sun and convert it into electricity, right? Um, I'm sure most of you know, but when you go into space, there isn't a, a plug, right? An outlet to plug into to, to get our electricity. So we have to generate our own. Now, there's a couple ways to do that, but um, quite some time ago, you know, 50, 60 uh, years ago, we realized, look, we can harness the energy in the sun uh, through solar cells or, or photovoltaics and create electricity to then run our electronics, run our spacecraft, charge our batteries, do what we need to do, right? And so long as you have view of that sun, you have, um, you know, essentially unlimited energy, unlimited uh, uh, electricity to, to convert to. So uh, what we're trying to create is a new solar array to help pr propel these small spacecraft into the next generation, uh, a new generation of capability. So, so let's kind of take a step back and walk through that. Kevin, if you might could pull up zero, zero again, and we're gonna, we're gonna step through these. Maybe if you could go back to, to, yeah, zero, zero. So I showed this one earlier really to highlight how small, small spacecraft and CubeSats really are. Right, you can see that one used the size of a coffee cup. If you have three of those used together, you're like a, a loaf of bread, right? A six U is is maybe a, a, a thick cereal box. Okay, so these are really small spacecraft. Um, uh, and Kevin, if you could go to a zero one, then. Okay, and and uh, uh, to get electrical power out of these spacecraft, it's actually quite difficult. So here I'm showing several different small spacecraft and each of those black things that you can see on the sides, uh, either pasted right to the side or, or kind of deployed out uh, from the spacecraft, 
each of those is, is a solar cell, is a photovoltaic, converting sunlight into electricity. And the amount of electricity that you get, um, there's many factors, but, but one of the big factors is the area, the number of solar cells that you have in the sun. And so you can imagine when you compare these small spacecraft to, to something larger, right? We're, we're typically putting spacecraft that are the size of a washing machine or a big freezer into space, right? Very large spacecraft, uh, which have a lot of surface area, uh, a lot of opportunity to deploy very large solar panels, you know, with a large number of solar cells and generate a lot of electricity. These small spacecraft are, are limited in that they can only have a handful, which means they've only got a little bit of electrical power. And ultimately that really chokes their capability. It really chokes what they can do. If you don't have enough electrical power, you know, you can't turn on uh, some of this really valuable equipment that scientists, exploration, uh, et cetera, want to go and do. Um, Kevin, let's go to uh, number two. So, you know, this shows a typical CubeSat small spacecraft solar panel. That's just my hand on my desk, just trying to give you a little bit of a side view. Um, you know, it is already pretty thin and pretty low mass. Um, and no doubt we could pack as many of these as we wanted, you know, within reason onto a CubeSat, onto a small spacecraft. But as I'm sure you can imagine, once we get three, four, you know, 10 of these packed in, it eats up all of our volume, right? And all of our mass allocation such that we can't put anything useful on. We can't put the cameras on. We can't put that science instrument on. We can't put the payload, which is the thing, you know, that we want to actually go and, and demonstrate or utilize in space. So, you know, there's really two options. You can grow your spacecraft to give you more room to pack everything in, right? Which is sort of counter to what we're trying to do with CubeSats and small spacecraft. The whole point is to keep it small. So certainly you could grow your spacecraft, which is what we traditionally do, or alternatively, you can shrink your components and do more from less, right? Shrink your electronics, uh, shrink your science instruments, and in the case of Lisa T, shrink the solar array. So um, yeah, let's go to that next one. So we uh, at, at NASA Marshall are working a lot on solar sails. Now the other two are, are gonna talk solar sails, so I'm just gonna briefly mention them here. Solar sails, take those same photons that I was talking about and actually generate propulsion through momentum transfer, through a, a reflection of that photon. Whereas that solar cell absorbs that photon and creates electricity, now we're reflecting that photon and creating thought thrust. So we're working these big solar sails which are thinner than a human hair. I mean, a, a tenth the thickness of a human hair. Um, and we put these on small spacecraft to go in and propel them, let them sail around um, outer space. And so, you know, with this uh, big solar sail hanging out there, we realized, well, could we put solar cells on this and make a very thin film, lightweight um, solar array, you know, to get a very large collection area for electricity from a very small mass and a very small um, uh, volume allocation. Let's go to that next picture. And that is what we are creating with Lisa T. So this is uh, a full stack up of a solar cell where it's got that, that solar sail thin film backing. It's got a flexible solar cell and then a flexible cover. And so compared to that uh, you know, side view that I showed you a couple pictures earlier of traditional state-of-the-art solar panels, this is about a 10th of the, of the thickness. And ultimately, uh, we can fit about 300, 400% more of these solar cells into the CubeSat for the same mass and volume allocation, meaning we can generate three times the amount of electricity uh, with the Lisa T than we currently can today. Uh, and what can you do with three times the amount of electricity? Well, now you can power, you know, that next generation science instrument or that 4K video camera. Um, or uh, whatever it is that, you know, the science and the exploration people want to go and do. Um, alternatively, we can go deeper into space. The further you go into space, the less sunlight there is to collect. It actually falls off at distance squared from the sun. Okay, so the energy you can collect very rapidly falls off. So when you take, say, a CubeSat to Mars, like the Marco missions, 
uh, you start to get very constrained on power um, uh, because there's so much less uh, sunlight available. It's something like 40% the sunlight. So again, you have to have a two, two and a half uh, um, times as big uh, solar panel just to make the same amount uh, of electricity. So as we want to do more out of these CubeSats, as we want to take them into deep space, we've got to have bigger power generation. And if we don't want to grow that spacecraft, you know, into the larger size, we got to do more from less. We got to shrink our solar arrays. And we've done that utilizing these thin film materials. So let me show one video and then maybe we can pause there. And I've, I've got uh, a ton of other stuff we can go over, but I think that's a good stopping point. So this video gives um, what we call a TRL-4 demonstration. TRL-4 means we've prototyped it, it's in the lab. We're not yet putting it into space uh, or even simulated space environments, but we're proving out it can work. So this is a sample solar array. The video is being shown in reverse to show you how it folds up. Now we're gonna show it forward and at a slower speed so you can really get a feel. So that's that one new CubeSat down at the bottom. We take up about half of the CubeSat and we deploy this solar array away from that CubeSat. So you're seeing electrical harnessing, you're seeing those booms. And now we're gonna actually release all these thin film solar panels. So is that all spring loaded or is it sort of motorized to push up that it's central all, boom? Yeah, that's a good question. It's all passive, kinetically stored energy, spring loaded. That's very cool. Now this, now this part uh, we are unfolding and this is an active component. So we're using shape memory alloy. We're heating it up to unfold those solar panels. But once they lock into place, it again becomes passive, meaning you don't got to keep heating that shape memory alloy. It just gives you that oomph to unfold them um, and create your solar array. Now, this is a very special kind of solar array. I, I'm not going to go into the details. We can uh, have some questions if, if anybody was wondering why they were kind of angled as they were. Um, and this is a sample of another solar array, a more typical solar array that you'd see uh, on a small spacecraft. Again, in all its glory, uh, looks a lot like the first one, right? Just a little bit different structure. This is played in reverse. It's all folded up into that one U. And then now, we release that strain energy. And we'll unfold those petals. And does this happen about in the speed too, when it's up in space in real time or does it go faster or slower? About this speed, we'll, we'll do it a little bit faster. We were definitely taking our time, you know, to make sure we got it right. But it, now we've got it all dialed in and automated, you know, so you hit a button, it'll be a little bit faster, but, but within reason. So, you know, before I, I cut myself off here, um, you know, I told you this was the benchtop TRL-4. We've then taken this solar panel and we put it into space environments on the ground. So big vacuum chambers get it hot and cold. Um, we've got a nice video here uh, showing uh, deployments on a zero G on the Vomit Comet, the parabolic flight that, that does parabolas and simulates uh, microgravity. That's me in the, the kind of uh, uh, camo-like hat. Um, uh, we've, we've hit this with radiation, electrons and protons. For those of you that, that know those terms, atomic oxygen. We've really bombarded this with everything that it would see in space from microgravity through um, all that particulate radiation, thermal cycling, and the like to show that this thing really can deploy, can generate power, and then ultimately can survive in space. And to that end, we're working uh, right now a CubeSat mission. It's called PTD4, the Pathfinder Technology Demonstrator Number 4, um, to actually launch a Lisa T uh, in Q2 of FY24. So that's some government jargon. Basically, I'm saying spring of calendar year um, 2024, we're going to launch uh, something that looks a lot like what you see in this video and actually go and demonstrate it in a low Earth orbit, take measurements, watch it for six months, and see how it performs um, to prove it out. And then people will be able to start using it. So that's great. That's coming up then. 
rather quickly. Yes. Honestly. Yeah. Excellent. Very quickly. Um, we'll have to get our eyes open. For those interested, then there's a lot of room to grow from here, a lot of very interesting things we could talk about. And so maybe we'll get into some of those after uh, after the other conversations. Oh, one, one clarifying question on that. So this Lisa T module, is this a standalone item or is it more of an add-on to another cube set? Um, it is, it's standalone all the way through the wire harness, okay? And so uh, all it really needs from the host CubeSat is those signals, you know, to say, okay, deploy, right? Um, and, and, and then the ability for that host CubeSat to take that power in, um, you know, which okay. most host CubeSats are going to have, you know, those power boards, uh, uh, batteries, et cetera, that they need. And it's, it's well over 100 watts of power, right? Yeah, so um, th there's different sizes. And so we've got concepts from 100 watts of power all the way up to a kilowatt. Wow. Um, uh, you know, that, that kilowatt incredible. would be more for, for deep space applications. The ones you're seeing here are, are in the range of like a couple hundred watts to two to 250 watts. Okay. Yeah, for, for context, this is um, our solar panel for the, the CubeSat here. And this is one watt. So it's well yeah. over 100 times more than what we can do here. Which is why it's such a great application, right? Which is which is kind of cool to be having two like different perspectives here with the CubeSat. And maybe you guys could even use this for each other's projects, which is so cool. So let's actually transition now over to Alpha CubeSat. So our guest from Cornell University here. Um, the main mission overall is to deploy a light sail. So as uh, Dr. Carr was just saying, you know, creating this light sail, this thing that will be able to reflect the photons in order to create some thrust. Um, so I'm going to hand it on over to Joshua now, or Gillis, I suppose, both of you guys, uh, to talk a little bit about Alpha CubeSat. Give us kind of an overview of uh, your project and, um, you know, everything that's involved with that, too. Sure. Yeah, let's get some visuals up. Uh, Kevin, can you pull up the Alpha Mission artwork image? And I'll, I'll let Gillis give a stab at the, the pitch. I've done this too many times at this point. I'm the more I'm more of a newcomer to it than Josh, I suppose. Two years. Uh, the, the, the mission <laughs> artwork one um, it should be, I think, next to the mission profile photo. Thanks. Yeah. So here you got a um, pretty good view of three objects: um, the ISS, where we're going to be deploying from, the main CubeSat in the center there, and the light sail, which is really the main mission goal. But we do have a few other smaller goals along the way. Um, but basically, as John talked about before, uh, you can have a one-unit CubeSat, you can have many more units, but ours is also a one-unit CubeSat. Um, and then along the side there, if you look closely, you can see our solar panels, which are on each of the sides. Um, and that's what's going to give us our power, uh, which will allow us to release that light sail. Um, and that light sail is really a precursor to interstellar missions to other stars um, and we have those little chip sats are the orange things on each side there that will be the actual flight computers for the light sail because Alpha is hopefully going to have the first ever solo flying light sail. So previous light sails have been attached to their CubeSats. So Planetary Society had light sail one and two, and I believe those were three U CubeSats um, and a huge sail that came out from those three U CubeSats. But ours is going to completely get thrown out the hatch um, to go live its own life off on its own with its two little two little chipsets there. Um, so hopefully in the future, a sail similar to Alpha's, um, probably with even smaller little chipsets on it than that, um, will use the power of light propelling it to go to other stars. Um, theoretically, a design similar to ours could get to Alpha Centauri, the nearest star system in 20 years, which is, seems perhaps like a long time of our lifetimes, but 20 years is one fifth the speed of light. So that is 400 times faster than any current spacecraft that we have. So that would be pretty incredible. We're just a little stepping stone along the way. We're gonna stay in low earth orbit, uh, but the hope is that future missions after ours could have a light sail inspired by this. 
Very cool. And can you give us like a little bit of an overview about light sales too? I know uh, I was actually very surprised to learn uh, with one of these cool images that you actually gave us um, the history of light sales. It's been around for a while, all the way back to the 1600s. People were, were talking about this, right? Yeah, if you can pull up, I think it might be in a little subfolder, light sale subfolder maybe, um, but it should be uh, a history of light sales. Um, hopefully it's labeled. I added it this morning at the airport, uh, but it's from the Planetary Society um, and it sort of goes around in a circle and it's got a history um, of light sales starting back with Kepler um, hundreds of years ago, um, coming up with the idea of, hey, what if we used light as an actual source of propelling us um, and back then it was a very theoretical thing um, and then we have Arthur C. Clarke um, talk, making a, a short story where that's a possibility and Arthur C. Clarke tended to base his things sometimes more in science than perhaps people hundreds of years ago so we're starting to think about it and then Carl Sagan with the Planetary Society was proposing the idea going on Johnny Carson's show um, and then after that, um, after he was gone, the Planetary Society continued that dream um, and they did light sail one and two. Um, light sail one didn't really demonstrate sailing, but light sail two did. And it was up there for, I think, three years from 2019 to 2022. Um, and it was showing that it was able to adjust its orbit by using the power of the sun. Um, and so that's pretty neat. Those are solar sails. Um, and most of what people have been talking about for a long time is solar sails. Um, but if we want to get to Alpha Centauri, uh, then we're going to have to use something more powerful, something like lasers, maybe, um, to send us all the way to another star. And what, you know, first of all, for our rocket fans um, out there, Light Sail 1 was on an Atlas V, and uh, Light Sail 2 was on Falcon Heavy, which, of course, is a, a rocket that many of our fans are fans of. <laughs> um, but I do love this idea that, you know, 1964, Arthur C. Clarke is writing science fiction um, about, you know, the sun jammer, I believe it was called, uh, with the solar sail. And then for those who are fans of the show, For All Mankind, uh, I know in, a, in the most recent season, they actually unveiled a giant solar sail in order to get them, you know, further to Mars. So this is literally what we're seeing, you know, in our science fiction today as well. Um, hopefully that wasn't too much of a spoiler, but <laughs> that Operation Jolly Roger, I believe they called it, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, just that history, I think is just so neat. Um, so, you know, getting back into, of course, you know, idea of uh, sales though, and being able to fit all of that into such a tiny space, uh, we saw with Dr. Carr's image, um, you know, it was, it had to be all kind of folded up and, and, and real tiny. So you guys also are using this, this sort of origami idea. Um, and I believe it's called the Miura fold. Uh, yeah, we should have a, a visual as well. Um, there's a, a GIF called Alpha Light Sail, um, uh, origami folds. There we go. So, um, gives you, um, uh, a sense of what it's like. And... Our sales um a little a little bigger than um, the GIF that you see here. Um, Kevin, can you pull up the uh, Alpha Sail Two picture? So it's still it's still pretty small. Ours is all the way there on the on the right. Um, so it's about half a meter by half a meter, and that's been about the size that we can appropriately fold up and and fit within a half U cube set. So half of a one U is essentially all the space that we have in our in our little CubeSat compartment here. So it's it's a very compact fold and, and four of those chipsets that, that Gillis mentioned also have to have to fit on there in the in the sale department as well. And what are they made out of? Um, I, I think Dr. Carr, you said yours was like uh, thinner than the width of a human hair, very tiny, uh, very thin material there. Um, what, what is that made out of, first of all, Dr. Carr, yours? And then also, what is this Alpha Cubes, that one made out of? Yeah, at NASA, we are um, keen on a material called CP1, colorless polyamid 1. So it's a polyamid that doesn't thermal set, can be made really thin, um, you know, and our sales are in the range of like two microns to maybe, maybe five microns, somewhere in there. And then for Alpha? Yeah, ours are a little thicker than that, but it's a very different material. So ours are actually um, retroreflective, and 
It's made by Avery Dennison, and it's the type of material that you'd see on like street signs, you know, stop signs, bicycle reflectors, that type of stuff, where the light comes directly back at you. And yeah, there's a, a picture of that material. So it's it's a little, or in the case that we're flying with now, it's actually a lot thicker. It's around 175 microns or so. Um, but that was mainly due to us kind of handling it. Uh, there, there's one video, um, Alpha Sail Bolt 4 um, being folded. Uh, that one shows just exactly how we're handling this um, to, to fold it into the, the light cell compartment. And it's it's definitely being handled kind of roughly. And if we had a thinner material, it, it would probably break and it has broken in the past. So we are capable of designing these light cells to be even thinner than we're doing now and even lighter. But for the sake of a, a student project and, and being able to, to test over and over again without damaging the hardware, we, we decided to go with a, a thicker material. That makes a lot of sense. And I assume you've probably made many iterations of this <laughs> to ensure that it stays together and doesn't okay. rip. <laughs> Good enough. I mean, there, there's one that we did a, a high altitude balloon launch with, and it just kind of been shambles here after it came down. So we, we've definitely gone through a few, a few light sails here. There you go. And so it's all crammed into that little cube set there. It looked like actually in that video, it took up most of the volume of that. But again, this was the point. You want to deploy your light sail there. Um, and then and then what happened? So it, it, you were mentioning uh, spring-loaded, um, Dr. Carr, and, and I believe uh, yours also with Alpha, Alpha CubeSat is also spring-loaded? Yeah, Goes up we, also, we also use a, a shape memory alloy, uh, night null wire specifically. So uh, as long as it's around room temperature or, or warmer, it will want to restore to that original expanded shape. We sort of have this cross frame in the middle of the sail. Um, if you can pull up the Alpha Sail 1 image, uh, that might show it as well. Oh yeah, that's that's the full deployment of it restoring to its original shape. So here you can see the, the two wires that make an X in the middle. So that is, that is the entire structure of our sail. Um, and, and that's what causes it to, to unfold and also eject from the CubeSat rather rapidly and, and sail on its own. Amazing. So the goal then, um, you guys will have this go up on a uh, crew resupply mission. I believe you said, and then uh, they'll be releasing it from the ISS, right? Yep. Uh, we'll, we'll, de we'll be deployed from the space station, and then we have to be a, a sufficient distance away um, before we can actually eject the light sail. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole bunch of NASA safety protocols there to protect the astronauts on board, um, just in case this would... <laughs> hit the ISS or or cover a window or whatever it does. It, it's, we want we want to make sure that no, nothing that can go wrong should, should happen. So um, we'll be powered off and have to send a series of commands before it's actually ready to, to fire um, and deploy the sail. And is this going to be released with other CubeSats then? Are there just going to be these little boxes kind of floating around and releasing things left and right all up there? Uh, yeah, Gail, do you want to cover this one? Yeah, um, I mean, I believe ours will be released from the the GIF that I've seen uh, that demonstrates it. Um, our, they probably release ours um, in a series with other ones. Is that right? We're going to get sent up with other ones. Do they all release in at once, or do they release one by one? Oh, uh, one by one. Definitely don't want. Okay, yeah, we don't want each other hitting each other. Yeah, there, there's multiple stacks, so the ones in a stack actually do get pushed out, um, kind of in sequence uh, as as. Because like, ours is a 1U, and I think you could fit up to maybe 6U in, in a stack. It, it kind of depends on the deployer. So you could have two or three CubeSats come out um, in close succession. Mm -hmm. And there, there's definitely a few on the flight. So we, we usually time these with, with NASA so that there's several universities or other organizations that have their CubeSat ready so that we could share the same um, rideshare opportunity and, and, and launch together. That yeah, is... and this is a this is a good GIF showing after it's been released. Um, it does it needs to be in a certain orientation, so we don't want to just like send the light sail out willy nilly. Um, so we have magnet torquers inside these little coils um, that will align it with the Earth's magnetic field and make it such that it'll be spinning around, but only around hopefully that one axis that you can see there, and not just tumbling randomly and spewing out the light sail and not knowing where it's going to go. Yeah, and, and that's actually a good point of how do you orient 
a CubeSat to, well, first of all, like go where you need it to go, but also then, yeah, be facing the right direction so that you're not just, you know, launching it back down towards earth or something, which won't really help. Mm -hmm. So magnet torquers, you say. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if Josh wants to get into technical, if we've got technical questions about that one. Um, but yeah, they are just really little, I believe copper, um, just little uh, coils. Um, and mo all of our stuff is, it's really not super high tech things. It's, things that a lot of people, hobbyists can buy, um, breakout boards, that sort of thing. So our intention with it is, as many CubeSats are, to be a sort of low cost um, alternative to extremely expensive, huge spacecraft. And of course, we only, we want to deploy a pretty small light sail, so it makes sense. Yeah, and actually when we were talking earlier, I remember you said something one of you guys said something to the extent of uh, you were working with toy makers because they're really good at kind of scaling down these electronics for small things like this. Sure. Yes. So both of our our mentors for this project are, are Silicon Valley inventors and engineers, and they they spent a large part of the careers working for um, companies that that consult for for toy toy companies, and um, a lot of very intricate engineering has to to go into making a, a children's toy to have let's say a robotic dog or a, a toothbrush that can tell how well you're brushing your teeth. There, there's a lot that goes into uh, making those smart electronics in such a compact package that can be sort of thrown around by a toddler. Um, yeah, there's, there actually is a lot of translation to something like a CubeSat that has to survive a, a rocket launch and fit into such a small package as well. Of course, yeah. Um, I'm curious too, um, we've, we've got some questions actually already coming in. Um, talking about, you know, really scaling things down and, and getting smaller over time. Um, someone's asking, is there such a thing as like an eighth U or a half U CubeSat that could, you know, be even smaller than this one U? I know we've talked about having larger, but is there anything even smaller than the one U right now? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And yeah, there there is. So um, CubeSats are, are considered nano satellites and it can go down to Pico and what we call our chipsats is as femto satellites. So it can, these these weigh on the order of a couple of grams, whereas a CubeSat is a thousand times that. Right. And they're they're sort of in betweens. Um, so uh, Pocket Cubes is a new one that's a quarter of a CubeSat, and they they've launched before. And then there's also FinSats. That's a good one to look up. That's about I think a third of a, a one U. So. Uh, those are like almost like slices of bread as opposed to a loaf of bread. And, and they, they are um, freestanding spacecraft as well. Dr. Carr, have you worked with any of these like very teeny tiny CubeSat type things? These slices no, of bread? We, we, we haven't gotten into those yet. We, we certainly have used those components to build out these bigger, uh, uh, you know, 3U and, and 6U, 12U CubeSats, but uh, haven't gotten the opportunity to do the, the slice of bread just yet. <laughs> um, and someone was also asking, um, what materials are typically used to make the frames of these 1U CubeSats? I know the coffee cup picture, it, it kind of looked like a metal. And um, I believe with the Alpha CubeSat, you guys 3D printed yours? Yeah, we did. Um, we actually have a nice visual of the, the 3D print uh, sequence there. We, we definitely tried out a, a lot of cheaper materials for the prototyping phase, um, which was great. We made all those on the order of five weeks in a summer and um, only cost us probably just a, a couple hundred bucks at most in terms of uh, materials and um, equipment there. Um, the actual material that will fly with is, is a bit stronger. It's called Acura Bluestone, and, and this is definitely robust. And there's CubeSats that have launched using this for propellant tanks, like highly pressurized uh, propellant that, that needs or that has strong forces against the walls of, of this material and it's able to withstand that, survive lo rocket launches. So we use all the, the prototyping on, on cheaper 3D printers that you might even have at your home or your school and, and then we'll contract out the, the final prototype here. Right and Dr. Karp, so historically what has been used and um i've you know we've seen those trays i guess of like the loaves of bread right with the many cubesats in it is that made out of something different or is that generally the same as the one used yeah you know at nasa we've traditionally used aluminum uh, mm -hmm. for our small spacecraft and cubesats and usually usually it's a anodized aluminum or or uh, other chemically treated or coated aluminum um, you know as we get into the more complex missions you know with more sensitive equipment 
and longer lifetimes, um, uh, both thermal and structural integrity, uh, you know, becomes a big concern. So, you know, utilizing aluminum with different coatings on it allows us to change a couple of words for you, absorptivity and emissivity, uh, which in turn allows us to better control the temperature inside the box, you know, protect our electronics or protect that, that piece of science equipment. Uh, same is true for launch loads. As you go and, and launch these into space, they, they uh, um, see a lot of vibration, right? A lot of shock uh, and acoustical vibration. So, you know, in order to make sure we don't have parts break, again, when we're dealing with these more sensitive uh, um, instruments, you know, that, that aluminum tends to give us that added strength um, uh, that we need. Now, there are some interesting concepts to, you know, move over into carbons, uh, right? Carbon fibers and carbon composites, uh, ultimately to create lighter and lighter CubeSats, uh, which support solar sailing. Because as we go and we solar sail, uh, you'll find that it becomes not just about that sail itself, how big can you get it and how much light are you reflecting off of it, but how low is the mass, that payload that you're trying to propel. So if we can get that mass way down, for example, by replacing aluminum, you know, metal parts with, with carbon composite, carbon fibers, um, uh, it's, a, it's a huge add to the overall propulsion that we get. So yeah, I guess the ultimate goal then is to make it as light as possible to be able to go further. Um, and that actually brings us to uh, the, the chip sats, I think would be a good transition here. So with alpha, uh, alpha sat, um, you guys have been working on, well, maybe not you specifically, but your, your colleagues have been working on um, reducing the weight, the size of these chip sats, which ultimately you'd like to be kind of this um, smallest uh, spacecraft, independently flying spacecraft, really, um, on this light sail. So can you talk a little bit about these chipsats? You are going to have four of them um, on your light sail. Um, they're functioning as flight computers, right? Um, and it's going to allow you to completely disconnect from your host spacecraft of this CubeSat de deployable. Um, but talk to us a, a little bit about chipsats themselves. So what are they? Um, you know, what are they going to be doing specifically? Um, will we be able to communicate with them? Are they sending us anything? And kind of what's what's been the history of that so far with Cornell? Yeah, I'll let Josh take this as the main chipset guy. Yeah, that, that project also falls under my domain these years. So um, yeah, chipsets have been going on for a while um, at, at Cornell. It's definitely been considered by a, a few people outside of our lab as well. We're just one of the, the earliest to, to really prototype and even fly it into space. So the idea is having some sort of, of a gram scale spacecraft or, or smaller uh, that has all the essential functionality that you'd expect in a larger satellite. So by essential functionality, I mean it has a source of power it has sensors, it has a computer to, to read that sensor data and a radio to send it down to Earth and, and some kind of structure to hold all that together. So all of that can be fit on such a small package that, that um, in the example here on the screen, can fit on that light sail on a single square um, that fits inside our CubeSat. It weighs, that particular model weighs two and a half grams. It was designed by the PhD student before me and um, it can talk all the way down to, to Earth, so over 400 kilometers. And that, that's been the, the big problem I've been trying to solve over this past year, getting us ready for flight. But yeah, so, this is a, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, so you guys have been working on this for a while. Um, there's the, uh, I believe it was 2011 um, on Endeavor, the last flight of Endeavor, the space shuttle. You know, all the space shuttle lovers out there, um, and myself included, <laughs> work with the Enterprise. Um, but they actually sent up uh, the 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 Sprite, I believe it was called, um, and they mounted it inside of the ISS. Is that right? Yep. Sprites are sort of the, the nickname for those earlier chip sets. And uh, yeah, that was, that was a very sort of last minute experiment. Like the, the idea was there for a while and they had some of the equipment, uh, but there was this very last minute launch opportunity that came up. Uh, also part of one of those um, Missy missions that, that send one of those material science experiment uh, panels on, on the side of the space station. So they had some extra space and they called our professor, Mason Peck, and said, hey, you know, do you have anything that you'd be able to, to launch? And he's like, sure. And then 
at the lab meeting the same day. He's like, hey, does anyone have anything <laughs> that we can launch? And um, Zach Manchester and, and Justin Atchison were the, the students at the time. We, we really threw this together um, over the course of two days and, and drove it down to, I think, D.C. or Maryland um, to actually to launch. And it was up in space for, for at least two years. Um, and this proved that this type of off-the-shelf uh, smartphone type electronics can survive the harsh space environment for long periods of time, um, the radiation, the temperature, extremes, vacuum. That's so cool. And so then ever since then, you guys have just iterated on it, right? You've got later on, you uh, had the KickSat, right? Um, and then I know, I think that there was like a failure of, of deploying one of them, but then eventually you had KickSat 2. Um, and that, I think that we kind of saw an image of that earlier too, but that released a bunch of them showing like you were saying that they actually can survive out there um what what exactly is happening when you've released all of these like you said it's um it's collecting a lot of data and everything is it collecting it in real time is it because i would assume as they fall back through the atmosphere they'd probably just burn up right so is it setting it back in real time uh, yep, has to be real time. Uh, and you're right, they do burn up in the atmosphere. That's definitely a, a strict requirement with a lot of things that you send to space. We don't want these little chipsets raining down on people. Um, <laughs> so NASA does a whole orbital debris um, assessment report called an ODAR, and that's that's part of the launch approval process for CubeSats. So yeah, they, before they, they burn up, we do have to collect all the data um, as they collect it. Um, there's not a lot of memory on board, so it's really just reading the sensor and transmitting it immediately and whatever ground stations can pick it up around the world will we'll collect that data and, and send it to a, a main server that's so interesting so is this what you would call a swarm then uh yes and no so okay. and and sort of the, the academic context swarms usually mean like a, a group that can talk to each other and, and sort of make autonomous decisions sort of operate as a network in these earlier technology demonstrations like kicksat um, it's it's really just proving that each individual one can can hear and, and operate independently and transmit to the ground. They're not really talking to each other. We demonstrated that in lab, um, but here it's really just saying like, hey, if we deployed a hundred of them, that even if a, a fraction of them survive, that that's still mission success. That you have this sort of strength in numbers with with such a small package. Got it. Got it. So how do you guys test this sort of thing then? So, oh, uh, you know, you, you put them together. Oh, yeah, right? How do you, yeah, how do you uh, kind of see how that all goes? Yeah, we've done some high altitude balloon launches, uh, which are always very exciting because you go there and you watch and pump up the big balloon and then you let it go and it's a big moment. Um, and then we have typically a little, oh, yeah, that's the video I took. <laughs> it's really exciting to be there in person. Um, and you can see right on the end there is our little prototype CubeSat. Um, that's just a styrofoam box inside the, all the electronics that we need for this launch. Um, and then we see if we can communicate um, with the systems on the ground. I'm not sure if this one specific one involved. Oh, yeah, this one probably involves communicating with chipsets, but we also have to communicate um, with the CubeSat computer um, since that's separate from the light sail. So we have to test the, both of those things. Um, and so here you see, I think we're only about a third of the way to space, even though it's starting to look like space. Um, but that's a good step um, in the process of getting up to low Earth orbit communications there. So it sends out the light sail. Uh, we get to test if we can send the command to deploy as well. Um, and then this is the one kind of chipset that we are allowed to rain down um, because then this drops back down to Earth. It's not high enough to burn up, fortunately. Um, but then we have to go scout out um, in people's farms uh, and hope it doesn't drop in Cayuga Lake or anything like that. Um, we've been pretty fortunate so far. Did get stuck in a tree once, um, but we did get it down from the tree as well. So that sounds like so much fun though, <laughs> to be hunting around for this thing that was just up in space. Gosh. <laughs> yeah, it's like our, our fun little field trips that we get to do. Um, and with this one in particular, we had all those um, 360 cameras and you can see even more cameras in this shot. Um, so we got great footage of the whole two or three hours that it was going up, uh, even footage of the balloon itself popping. Um, so a little fun sidetrack there that we can do with the cameras. Uh, we will not have this kind of footage when we're actually in space, so we have to take it while we can get it. That seems like it'd be a really fun day to come to class. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. 
sending up weather balloons and things. That's super, super cool. Um, Dr. Carr, I bet you guys have a little bit more, maybe a little less ragtag, uh, you know, approaches for testing this sort of thing, which there's nothing wrong with. DIY stuff is so great. You guys are killing it over there at Cornell. Um, how do you guys, you know, I know chip sats maybe, did you use something like a chip sat with, uh, with Lisa T? No, no, no chip sat. We're using a full, full cube sat. Um, um, but, you know, it's not too unlike what they're doing, just probably more rigor, um, you know, and, and a bit more, we have a bit more, uh, what's the right word, um, capability at our, uh, uh, you know, use here, right, at our fingertips being at NASA. So, you know, we'll start on the ground, um, you know, I showed like some of those TRL4 type stuff, that means in the bench, uh, right, in the lab, okay. Uh, and then we'll move into chambers and we've got ch a chamber for everything. And chamber means a, a vacuum chamber simulating what it's like in space per a certain environment. So it could be a thermal vacuum chamber or it could be a radiation vacuum chamber, atomic oxygen vacuum chamber, ultraviolet radiation vacuum chamber. If you're going to the moon, there's a lunar regolith vacuum chamber, right? So it's all about um, thinking about where your widget, where your technology is going to operate, and then trying to recreate some of those environments back on Earth so that we can reasonably cheaply and quickly um, figure out where the problems are, you know, break it and fix it. And, and then from there, from those chambers, we could start stepping up. So I showed you a video of myself on the, the Vomit Comet, the Zero-G uh, flight to do parabolas. We then do balloons as sort of that next level up. And in fact, sometimes we fly balloons as standalone missions, you know, to collect Earth science. But most certainly we utilize balloons just as they did. Um, above that, we have sounding rockets and other suborbital flights, right, that, that give you, um, uh, you know, maybe 30 seconds or, or uh, you know, some short window of some kind of space access in a suborbital way. Um, and then we have the International Space Station, you know, sort of that next level up. Uh, and I've actually sent samples of Lisa T to the International Space Station. I think Joshua mentioned it early on a platform called MISI, the Materials on International Space Station Experiment or, or something like that. And, and uh, um, what you do is you put together a plate with all your materials that you are thinking about utilizing, our solar cells, that CP1 sail, uh, could be different coatings we wanted to test on the solar sails. And you send it up to the space station and the astronauts, you know, uh, being a little crass, they just kind of hang it outside, you know, open the window and, and hang it outside and, and let it sit in space for six months or for a year. Uh, and then they go and grab it and ship back down where you can study it um, in your lab. Now, when you start to combine all of those things together, or, or maybe not all of them, but you pick, you know, the, the important piece parts, uh, well, then you're at a pretty good technology maturity. We generally call that a TRL-6 when you're, you're tested into these environments and you feel like you're ready for flight. And that's when we go and do, you know, a, a, a free flyer or just like uh, uh, this team is doing, uh, something sent off the International Space Station, uh, et cetera, to really go demonstrate that technology uh, and set it up, you know, so that a mission user can come and, and grab onto it and use it for or for something real, you know, for something useful. And would you say that there's, this is actually a question that somebody just sent in, would you say that there's an advantage of deploying from the ISS rather than directly from a rocket, like a Falcon 9 transporter mission or or like a ride share on Electron? Or does it really, maybe is it just dependent on what's, what is the point of the, the CubeSat, right? Or the mission of it, where it needs to go, how high? Yeah, yeah, for me, it's just dependent on on those mission parameters, um, you know, on ISS, you're going to be pretty low, uh, right at 400. So you're going to decay uh, pretty rapidly, depending on your ballistic coefficient. But it's generally a cheaper ride. You know, we're sending uh, mass up to International Space Station all the time. We've got nanoracks, racks. We're, we're set up to do this. Uh, so it's a bit cheaper ride. Whereas if you have a more unique orbit, like you said, it could be uh, higher altitude, or it could be a different inclination. You know, you may want to go sun synchronous uh, uh, or into a polar orbit to test something in particular. Then uh, you need to look at more of a free flyer and, and a ride share to, to get to those, uh, you know, slightly more unique orbits.
Um, and another question actually kind of related to that launching that came in, do CubeSats, or I, I suppose it would be the people creating the CubeSats, have to prove any kind of technical qualifications to the launching company in order to make sure that, you know, they trust you and that it's not just going to end up as some space debris? And obviously things can go wrong, but what is the process of getting a CubeSat approved, I guess, and, and saying like, yes, we're actually going to accomplish our goal. Trust us. Launch us. Yeah, it's a really good question. And it 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 uh, depends on the mission itself and the launch provider that you're working with. But most definitely, there are regulations there uh, that you have to prove, right? Um, uh, you know, ground safety is a big one, right? So say you had um, uh, some combustible propellant that you were trying to, to test, you know, that would be a concern, a uh, health and safety concern for crew, right? So that we don't have an issue there. Um, if you're flying as a secondary, which most CubeSats do, you need to show that you're doing no harm to the primary, right? You may have a, a, a hundred million dollar primary mission, right? Or, or even in the case of SLS, a multiple billion dollar, you know, Artemis One launch that had uh, a handful of CubeSats on it. Um, you'll have to prove that you're going to do no harm to that main mission. Um, uh, and several, you know, throughout there. And then, um, you know, even after you deploy, I think Joshua mentioned, um, you know, then there's orbital debris. You need to prove that when you come down, um, you're not going to kill anybody, right? Uh, or there's a, a very, very low probability. You also need to prove that you will come down within, um, the guidelines are changing, but it's five to 25 years, depending on which guideline you look at. So you can't sit in orbit, you know, for more than 25 years, the current NASA guideline, or five years, the current FCC guideline, um, and, and many others, you know, throughout. Um, so yeah, when you do these things, you'll work with your launch provider, they'll provide you with some sort of ICD, is usually what it's called, an interface controlled document, uh, where they're really controlling, um, well, the interfaces between you and the launch vehicle. And within that, there'll be requirements. Here's the thermal you need to uh, survive. Here's the vibrational load. Here's the health and safety concerns. Um, we are adhering to the FCC guideline of five years on orbit, uh, and they'll lay all that out for you. And is it different yeah. for, yeah, for the student projects, I guess, do you guys have, I mean, obviously you have to write your reports for school, but <laughs> like, is there anything that's uh, a different process that you go through as a non-governmental yeah, I was just going to point out that for us at ISS level, we will not be there for five years. Uh, yeah, we will be down much less than a year probably. But um, yeah, I've heard Josh talk about the paperwork, if he wants to talk about the paperwork. <laughs> yeah, that, that was actually originally my job. Um, Professor Peck pitched this to me as a, a fun one semester project to start my PhD, just do, a, do the paperwork while others finish up the CubeSat. CubeSat was not ready, so <laughs> now now I do it all. Um, but I, I did have to do a lot of paperwork my first year, and still continuing now. Um, uh, everything that that John mentioned also is kind of consistent for what we have to do: orbital debris, um, launch, making sure we can survive launch and, and, and prove that. Uh, another big one is just radio license. You need that approval before you launch, and we have to ensure that. The transmitters on board our chipsets and our CubeSat don't interfere with other spacecraft. Uh, so that, that's that's a big one as well. Um, and then when we have deployables, um, in the case of our light sail or in, in KickSat with that 105 chipsets that came out, uh, the timing of when we shoot those out is, is big as well. And we have to make sure there's no other uh, sort of traffic in the area, so to speak. Right. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Huh, that's so interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, you know safety concerns, obviously. Uh, involved in that, but huh, cool. Um, all right, so let's actually now we were talking about um, you know collecting light, you know, for power. Um, but something else that Alpha CubeSat is working on is using light, you know, obviously as thrust. And specifically, there's this really neat holographic component um, that I, I definitely want us to talk about for a bit. Um, I know. So again, uh, at the Intrepid Museum, we've got this exhibit um, and we are actually featuring a large part of it is the holograms and the artist who created um, some of these sculptures that were created into holograms. Um, I know Gillis, this is kind of one of your areas you know, to talk about here. So would love to hear just the process of what inspired you guys to incorporate holograms onto the sides of these solar panels of the CubeSat, first of all. How did you select 
what these images were, you know, what was the inspiration? Obviously, I have my Voyager earrings on, so I'm a big fan of that. We'll go there. Um, but why holograms and what are kind of the long-term implications of using holograms and how you might use it in a more, uh, on the light sale? I'll let you talk about it. I'll let you talk about it. <laughs> yeah. So C. Bangs is the artist behind the sculptures that were then turned into holograms. And she's been doing a lot of interstellar message work for decades, um, including for NASA. And so when I say interstellar message, I mean something like the Voyager Golden Record, where we send out some sort of thing saying, this is who we are into space. Maybe aliens find it. Probably not. But it's still a really nice idea um, to send a piece of ourselves up there into space. Um, and so with the holograms, um, I think part of the reason specifically for those is that we'd like to know how well they'll, they'll stay visible in space, how well they'll function, because holograms will have a practical application potentially for future light sails. Um, I'll get into that in a moment. Um, but here we have a fish hologram, uh, and we chose these holograms through a few series of votes. We had one with um, the team itself, one that was a more public vote that we sent out to sort of the Cornell um, student body. Uh, and then we did also one that's at the museum right now um, to choose the final hologram uh, between a leopard and a sleeping cat. Uh, we also got Bill Nye came on a visit uh, to Cornell and he chose one of the holograms as well. So we have a woman, a man, a fish, a moth, and then most likely the sleeping cat is going to win that vote there. So. Those are our hologram choices. Uh, oh yes, there's me with Bill Nye. That Can was you a, talk about this day? day. Because, yeah, <laughs> tell us, how did you get Bill Nye involved? What is he doing here? Like, yeah, so about. Bill Nye, since he's an alumni of Cornell, he likes to just come back at, like once a year at least and just go around campus. And he likes to tour, since he was an engineering student, um, tour the engineering labs. Um, so Josh and I were there that day and I presented the holograms. You can see them all on the table there. <laughs> He's giving them a studious look. Um, so that day, yeah, that was a crazy day. I also ended up meeting him again the next day, but that's, <laughs> that's another story. Um, so yeah, that's, we've got, we've got a lot of democracy and then we have also Bill Nye chose one of them. <laughs> so <laughs> which one did he pick? He chose the man to go along with the woman. That makes sense. Okay. It was also because it was one of the more visible ones. Um, some of them are a bit harder to see than the others. And we'd already chosen the fish and the moth, which in my opinion are the most stunning um, visually of the ones that we chose. Um, so that was his reasoning there. Um, so yeah, we're mounting those on top of the solar panels. Uh, we've already done tests to ensure that putting holograms on top doesn't affect how much light they can take in. And yeah, here's a video you can see of us um, doing the conformal coating and putting them on top. So it's that green sheen on top of the, holo the uh, solar panels there. So that's the reasoning for the artwork side of things um, to make a interstellar message potentially in the future, even though we're not going to other stars. Um, with holograms, ours specifically are just 3D images. So you tilt your head and you can sort of see the 3D effect. Um, but a future light sail could have maybe potentially hundreds of different images that change when you tilt your head. Um, so if you've ever seen like trading cards that'll maybe change what you see on them as you tilt your head, that would allow us to potentially put a lot more information in an interstellar message than say maybe the golden record. Although even the golden record, that has the audio. So we can't do the audio, a uh, little bit of a trade off there. Well, that's um, assuming that, you know, whatever encounters the record actually figures out how to play the record in the first place. <laughs> All yeah. those confusing messages, which we could go into, mm -hmm. forever, but we won't. <laughs> yeah, and here's the fish, which I think is, is a really good view. And we've also got DNA there, which I believe is behind the sleeping cat. So that's pretty neat. So those are our artistic holograms. Um, and then we also have, we're going to put Voyager um, on our light sail, which will be pretty neat. Um, and as a little sort of tribute to the Voyager Golden Record, because I always like to quote the same Carl Sagan quote, because I love it so much, um, that for small creatures such as we, the vastness is bearable only through love. So I like to think we're sending a little piece of ourselves up there into space, making the vastness a little more bearable when we send up all those messages. 
But I did say that there is a practical reason for it as well, not just the sentimental one, uh, which is that holograms potentially could help us keep a laser riding light sail in the beam of the laser. Um, so if you've ever seen a ball on sort of a stream of air, I used to see those a lot at children's museums, uh, and it sort of just stays there floating. Um, so that's sort of a similar concept to the laser beam uh, and a sail with sort of a curved spherical hologram on top of it. To the light, it'll behave like it's sort of just a sphere. Um, but that allows us to have a rectangle shape that'll be easier to produce, but then still have the light act as if it's a sphere and keep the beam, keep the sail in the beam. Could we, so, could we pull up some of the images in the, the Breakthrough Starshot folder just to accompany that? Yeah, so Breakthrough Starshot is our inspiration. Um, and that this is the, the group of people that are trying to fund ways to get to Alpha Centauri. So and there's a lot of things. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say there's a lot of things that we have to do before we get to, and I see he's holding up sort of a, a chipset looking thing there. One gram or less for the chipsets is the goal. Um, and then you have to solve tons of other issues like space dust along the way. Um, so we still got to get a pretty far away, but we're hoping that Alpha CubeSat can be a little stepping stone for that. And Breakthrough Starshot, so they're hoping to send a thousand light sails to Alpha Centauri uh, with lasers, kind of similar to what you guys are doing there, um, which could accelerate them, they're saying, to 20% of the speed of light um, after just a few minutes. Yes. Um, so, I mean, it's a lofty goal, right? We, we're we still trying to figure out how to travel quickly uh, and to be able to to reach, you know, light speed, whatever, warp speed, whatever <laughs> fandom you're part of. Um, but yeah, there's lots to think about the debris, right? The power of the lasers, um, how to get everything even smaller. Um, Dr. Carr, I know, you know, again, just dealing with super, super thin materials, like is the, the, the debris, the dust, I mean, I would assume that would just rip it to shreds, right? How are they, how are you guys kind of, um, you know, dealing with just space debris, that idea in general? Yeah, you know, um, especially micrometeoroid in, it impacts can, um, can be a big deal. So what we do on our solar sails and is in a pseudo way incorporated onto Lisa T is called rip stops. So essentially we assume we're going to get debris hits, you know, especially micrometeoroids. It's a probabilistic, you know, statistical thing, right? Um, as it turns out, when we deploy, you know, when you go larger and larger in these sails, you're probably going to get some rips uh, as well in your sail. Um, I mean, like I said, these are two microns, three microns thick, you know, these are, are extremely thin, extremely lightweight, surprisingly strong, uh, if you guys ever get an opportunity to 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 feel you, you know these, you can you can really pull on them. I mean, they'll rip, but you can really pull on them. Nonetheless, you're going to get tears, and so what we incorporate are rip stops, so that if we do get a rip, uh, it doesn't propagate. And so these are areas of of um, strengthened material, um, right seamed and strengthened, uh, to contain you know these rips, uh, such that when you know micrometeoroid hits causes a tear, that tear may propagate, um, but it only goes so far. And so we only lose some small percentage of that sale, which we can then calculate uh, and ensure we just make that sale large enough, uh, right, to, to still be able to finish the mission. All right, so yeah, lots to think about in terms of that. Um, what are what are kind of your future plans now with these things? So again, Alpha CubeSat's going to be a prototype. I mean, Lisa T is also a prototype, I, I suppose, in its own sense. Um, what are the kind of like the long term plans here? What you all are hoping to kind of continue on once you're done with this project? Do you want to move on to something else, or kind of keep working on this, or how does you know? What are your thoughts? Sure. Well, I, I think Gills and I might be running out of time with our. Our degree program here at Cornell, so it, it might be the only spacecraft that we personally work on here. But after Alpha, there's plans for successors, you know, a, a beta CubeSat, so to speak, and um, they they will involve um, more development of the light sail technology. Actually, I have a folder with some images of, of future sails um, that our our mentor um, Andrew Philo is is developing. These look a lot like the Alpha sail, 
Um, but the main difference is that more steering capabilities. So they they're using that retro reflective material, the same that we have, but but modulating it using uh, piezoelectric actuators. And by just pivoting the the retro reflective panels, you can control the amount of reflectivity that you get. So one side could be more reflective than the other side, and that, that would cause it to to steer and, and rotate. Um, so you can actually start to develop trajectories again, assuming your orbit's high enough. With with our current launch, we're we're going to deorbit due to that low altitude in the space station. But if you got a higher launch, um, then you could go do a, a moon sort of reconnaissance out and back or, or, or a Mars kind of entry mission um, and have a sail or multiple sails land on Mars. So that, that would be some cool um, mission paths in the, in the future. Uh, yeah. Definitely in, in those cases, the, the radio problem gets really hard at, at that low power. So we need either more solar cells like what John is developing or... Uh, we could potentially use, uh, the, again, the, the sail material to use optical communication and, and fire light, smaller lasers um, at the sail and, and get that modulation to sort of create ones and zeros and, and get information out of that. And then um, there's also actually, you had given us some interesting images of, uh, I mentioned this earlier, but maybe this is a better context for it, the swarms, right? So I suppose that means they'd be able to talk to each other and you had some pictures of like swarms around an asteroid, swarms around, um, you know, Jupiter, like Saturn's rings, uh, that sort of thing. Is that kind of long-term applications now for the chipsets too? Yeah. So the light sailing is just one application of the chipsets. And um, yeah, thankfully the, the grad student before me, Hunter, put together a lot of these amazing visuals of what you could do with um, chipset swarms here. So um, through strength and numbers, you, you can do interesting science that, that you might not be able to do with a traditional spacecraft. You can measure sort of everywhere all at once and, and capture phenomena like uh, changing temperature or magnetic fields uh, around a planetary body um, through this wide distribution of, of these chipset sensors. And they can talk to each other, they can talk to a mothership or, or to the ground in the case of Earth, uh, where we'll definitely start testing these initially before we go anywhere else. But really, you could go kind of anywhere in the solar system and, and deploy hundreds, if not thousands, of, of these chipsets. I love this, too, with Enceladus here. How cool would that be to drop it with some of that organic geysers, those cryo geysers going up, too? So neat. Um, so, th yeah, it definitely seems like there's long-term applications for a lot of this technology, which is ultimately, I guess, what CubeSats are really all about, right? Being able to, you know, test this, this technology um, I almost even imagine here on Earth, like, could you just dump a bunch of CubeSats into like a tornado or chipsats rather and like get data that way? Would that not be safer than flying a plane through one? <laughs> yeah, they, they probably could. Yeah. Uh, one, I mean, one of the reasons that we're um, studying the chipsats is that they're so um, lightweight. And John mentioned the ballistic coefficient earlier. These will slow down very quickly and sort of float down on Earth. They're very... Uh, subject to, to winds and it could definitely stay up in the air longer and, and conduct some interesting science through, yeah, say a tornado. And I know that here at Cornell, I think um, through the agriculture school, they put it on a cow. Um, and so, so there's definitely like applications of, yeah, you can do a lot with technology that small. So, so using it for like biomonitoring then, I guess? Or is that more of a, just kind of their conditions? Um, I think so. Yeah, I, again, it was very much an initial test to see what, what sorts of data we can get. Um, so one, one of the interesting ones that came out of this particular test is that Hunter had put uh, an ambient light sensor on, on those chipsets. And it turns out that, that baby cows, cows can actually, when, when they nap, they tend to tuck their, their chin under their arm and it blocks the chipset. So we saw these light and dark patterns in the middle of the day that corresponded to the, the cow's napping patterns. Oh, so there's a lot of applications then. Wow, <laughs> a lot of different ways you can test things out, cool. Um, we actually had another question come in. Um, this might be a good question for you, Dr. Carr, um, related to solar flares. So, you know, what do you do when you've got something that's, um, you know, collecting the photons and, and whatnot out there? How are they? How are CubeSats and these solar arrays affected by solar flares? And do you do anything to combat that, or would you just delay a launch if you knew one was coming? 
Yeah, so the, the solar arrays themselves are not overly affected by the, the, the flares. You know, we designed the solar arrays to be able to take so much radiation. Um, you know, and having a quick burst like that doesn't tend to, um, you know, burn anything out or, or, or cause any issues. Certainly in some special cases, you know, if you have some electronics that are sitting right on the, the solar array, uh, it can. More uh, importantly is what's happening inside the CubeSat. And that's where um, solar activity, you know, can really affect things. So we get uh, a lot of electronics inside the CubeSats, right? And we're worried about two things, the total ionizing dose, that's the total radiation coming and hitting these electronics, but then single event upsets, right? And so when you get some solar activity that spits something out that, uh, um, uh, you know, is really high energy, is really high fluence. Um, it can cause, you know, these single event upsets in your electronics where, um, you know, you may be doing some processing, your, your, your flight computer is chugging away, and then all of a sudden this radiation comes in and flips bits, you know, it, it, it messes up the computer. Um, and so it can really wreak havoc. It can cause stuff to lock up. It can cause uh, data to be lost. Um, you know, and, and so there's certainly different methods we can do to protect against that. There's, you know, redundancy, we can use shielding, uh, but ultimately these small spacecraft, there's only so much room and mass, right? Um, so you get, you get very limited on what you can do and, and it becomes uh, something that you uh, may just accept as a risk uh, and certainly we lose missions because of it. Um, uh, you know, there's a couple passive things we can do, such as if we know something is coming, if we have an early enough warning, we could shut down the CubeSat. So then it's not running, you know, or put it into a safe mode where things are, are minimally running. Uh, again, to, to have a lower probability of, of uh, you know, a catastrophic event. Um, but it's interesting not to, to, to get on the soapbox on the topic, but, you know, um, space weather monitoring and early storm detection and warning systems is a big deal. Uh, and NOAA, uh, right, the government agency NOAA is really charged with doing that. Um, and so it's a big deal, not just for all of our uh, national assets and our CubeSats, but also for manned missions, right? Because that's where you can really get into trouble if you, if you get an astronaut caught uh, in, in a radiation storm. And so one of the best ways to actually uh, get closer to the sun so that we can have earlier monitoring of these space weather events is via solar sails. So with big solar sails, we can actually go to what's called sub L1, sub Lagrangian point one. Y'all can look up where that is between Earth uh, and the sun. And we can sit there with the sail and monitor you know, these flares, monitor that solar activity. And when we see something that's not right, send that information back you know, to our GPS satellites, to our manned missions, uh, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can get put into these safe modes uh, and do the best we can to protect ourselves and our assets. And the Lagrange points, again, something that uh, if anyone's been following James Webb, that is a major component of why they decided to stick things up there, stick it, <laughs> the telescope up there. Um, and actually, so speaking of that, I guess it's like space weather um, and like temperature differences and things, um, we have two questions that came in that are kind of, you know, speaking to this. So um, how do you handle thermal management just with rapid day night cycles in low earth orbit? And also just with temperature differences in general, um, you know, one of you mentioned um, shape memory alloys. So how, when, you know, outer space is very cold, how would that affect solar panels over time? Um, you know, just with the temperature differences being so polarizing, just, you know, with erratically retract or partially open or something? Yeah, so in ours, we've designed it such that after it opens, it actually locks into place. So then you don't need that shape memory alloy because most certainly as it gets cold, um, it's going to lose that shape and it's going to get kind of flimsy. But we have a structure that locks in um, and so it doesn't matter. There are a lot of concerns on the solar array itself, though, as you go from these extremes, you know, in the sun uh, to, to in the dark, you can have well over 100 degrees Celsius of temperature change that happens in, in a matter of, of minutes, you know, and sometimes even seconds. Um, and this is especially true with thin materials, right? When you have thicker pieces of metal, thicker materials, they have a bit of a thermal mass, so they resist that quick change. But the thinner that material, the quicker that change becomes. 
Um, and so, you know, we've seen on the solar array, you can get issues with things uh, delaminating, things peeling. Uh, there's a concept called the coefficient of thermal expansion, right? So when things get cold, they contract. But let's say one material contracts a lot faster than another material, you can start to get cracking, delamination, and peeling. So um, we handle that, you know, through design. You have to pick your materials carefully, and that's a lot of the engineering that goes in and, and testing. Now, within the spacecraft, um, we have more flexibility because we have opportunity where we can control that thermal environment. So we can put in heaters, for example, use the solar array to charge up batteries. And then when we go into the dark and the eclipse, we can then run those heaters to keep things a little bit more stable. When we're in sunlight and it's getting hot, you know, we can cut those heaters and then we use emissive coatings uh, to help dump waste heat. Uh, you know, into deep space. For those of you that are interested, you can look up black body radiation. Um, but you can see there's a lot of uh, engineering that goes into that and a whole field dedicated just to thermal engineering and thermal modeling of these missions uh, to make sure they close and, and how to close them. And for Alpha CubeSat, for like the long-term, you know, goals of getting out to Alpha Centauri, is there anything that's been considered about how cold it'll get, I guess, as you get out of, you know, our solar system here and, you know, start heading towards our other distant star there? Sure. Um, thanks. Thankfully, it's not one of the problems that I personally have to solve right now. Um, Probably won't have this for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's definitely one of the, the many sort of miracles that, that the Breakthrough Starshot um, Committee has, has to solve before they get closer to, to launch. It's so interesting. There's so much to think about. And, and, you know, as you were saying, too, I guess just a lot of trial and error that goes along with this as well. Things that maybe you haven't even thought about, but figuring out, you know, the rip stops, for example, with the debris and the dust and um, just the way that the chipsats can communicate back to Earth or with each other and just all of those long term uh, applications. It's so interesting. You guys are all doing such amazing work. Um, and, you know, again, just thank you so much for being on here to to share just a little glimpse into your worlds. It's so interesting. And I bet a lot of our viewers had no idea that a lot of this work was even going on or if they happen to be students that they could even get involved in this themselves, which is so cool. And please do, everyone, please get involved with it if you're interested. Um, so um, I think that, that just about, believe it or not, we've been talking for an hour and a half already, so time flies. Um, but that is going to just about wrap up our show, um, bring us to the end. So um, Dr. John Carr, Joshua Gillis, thank you guys so much for being here, um, taking time out of your weekend to come hang out with us, talk about all the cool stuff you're working on. Um, CubeSats, SmallSat technology, chipsets, light sales, all of the things that we covered today. Um, it really was just so inspiring, you know, and anyone out there, you guys can get involved um, with this sort of space technology. So please do, you know, look into these programs and take these opportunities and, and you know, maybe you guys will be on here someday talking with them too. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks so much for spending uh, your time with us and uh, answering so many of these amazing questions too. Sure. Thank thanks you. Thanks so much for having us. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. So um, everyone, next month, uh, just a quick plug for our show next month, we've got another great show coming up for you. Um, keeping in line with some of the scientific experimentation that's going on here, we're going to be talking about Skylab. So Skylab just celebrated its 50th anniversary this year. So we're going to be talking a bit about that groundbreaking orbiting workshop up there uh, with some special guests. So be sure to tune into that. That's going to be Sunday, July 16th, again, uh, from 3 to 4.30 p.m. Eastern. So to learn more about that, you can visit intrepidmuseum.org. And uh, hey, if any of you guys tune in late today, no worries. You can always come back and rewatch this program at your convenience on any of the many streaming platforms that we have uh, put it out to. YouTube, Facebook, uh, Twitch, all of the platforms. You know how to find us if clearly you're watching us. Um, and once again, Virtual Astrolive is supported through a NASA cooperative agreement awarded to the New York Space Grant Consortium. So thank you to them. And thank you to all of you for supporting us each month and tuning in. So uh, once again, a big thank you to our guests, and we will see you all again next month. Thanks for tuning in. And here we go. The chamber pressure looks good. Following up.
43 unfolds to go. Indeed. We rise together, back to the moon and beyond. This is meant to be igniting the flare, correct?